Uh, good evening, ladies and gents. Uh, as Dave mentioned, my name is uh, Eamon Bowen. Uh, for those of you inside Dublin 4, my name is Eamon Bowen. Or I know there are a few of the people here who would know me as Eddie, so slightly different. That would take so slightly different. That would take a PowerPoint presentation on its own to explain the reason why there's two different names. Uh, I am, as Dave says, a local historian. Uh, I have written a book called Thirst for Freedom, and I have uh, done a lot of pub histories over the last couple of years, uh, various pubs across the city and across the country. Dave was saying about the uniqueness of this place. I spoke to the Guinness Archives. There are only 38 pubs in the whole of Ireland who have a family, uh, have a pub in the family for over 100 years. Only 38. There are only four in Dublin, and this is one of them. So it's a really unique occasion. So eight. There are only four in Dublin, and this is one of them. So it's a really unique occasion. So well done to them. So uh, tonight's uh, little spiel is going to take. Uh, Two parts. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about generally the pubs of Sandy Mount and a little bit of the history of Sandy Mount to see where we got to. It will be about O'Reilly's in particular. And I apologise if I got anything wrong since there's O'Reilly family members here. So, a little bit about uh, Sandy Mount itself. In 1654, in the Sandy Mount area as we know it, there was just 80 people living here. And that was made up of basically and their families. Something in 1766, there was 200 people living in Sandy Mount, and it was described at the time, at the time, as being 50% Protestant and 50% Papist. And again, if you go through Sandy Mount, you'll notice there's a lot more Protestant churches than there are Catholic churches. Again, it was a very Protestant area at the time. In 1791, a sea wall was built by Lord Fitzwilliam, who owned this area. He was uh, Lord Fitzwilliam and Marion. So he built a sea wall to keep the sea back. The area was seriously affected by flooding from the sea and flooding from the River Dodder. Uh, so he built a sea wall and he elevated the road uh, to try and stop the, the flooding. In 1795, the area was famous as a brickworks. It was not around Merlin Square or uh, Fitzwilliam Square. You'll notice an awful lot of red brick buildings. All those bricks were manufactured here in San Uh But again, like everything else in a capitalist industry, it became cheaper to get bricks from abroad. And uh, the quarry and the brickworks became... And uh, the quarry and the brickworks became obsolete. So it was closed. So Lord Fitzwilliam decided, well, Brickfield wasn't the place to sell it to the public. It wasn't something you would take it into the auctioneers and say, would you like to live in Brickfield? So he renamed the area of Brickfield and Scarlet Hill. Scarlet Hill is the area around of Brickfield and Scarlet Hill. Scarlet Hill is the area around Stardesee Church. It was a raised area. Uh, the river Dodder used to flow down where Leahy Terrace is and would flow down into the sea where Leahy Terrace is today. So that was called Scarlet Hill. So he amalgamated the two and it became Stanley Mount. Amalgamated the two and it became Stanley Mount. Uh, Richard Cranfield, again, anybody, I don't know if anybody lives in Cranfield Place, where Richard Cranfield opened the baths. Now, baths were very popular, but there were two different types of baths. So Richard Cranfield opened the baths for men, and Michael Murphy opened the baths for women. One, Michael Murphy changed his village beyond all recognition. Now, when the Brickworks was here, it brought in a lot of workers from outside the area. Were, it was a very popular uh, place to be. Uh, a lot of pubs opened up, a lot of sheep beans as we know them today, a lot of illegal drinking dens. He had one serious problem that he was really miffed about, again because it was quite a, a Protestant area. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, where men would work, there are two problems where drink and women. But that was his problem. But his problem wasn't, it was what we would describe as women of the night, prostitutes. Where in Sandy Mount, a lady who was fairly good looking, had probably a couple of nice assets, we call it, would get one shilling down. She'd be you know, like a bottle of milk going sour. 
So she'd only get six, she only get six pence, half a shilling. And if she's in Ring's End, they were known as hags. They only got tuppence. So Michael Murphy wasn't happy with this, so he made a big effort here on Yeomanry, which was basically a settlement the police force. And he moved the entire ladies of the night out of the area completely and moved them. Where else would you move them if you're south side of the Liffey? You move them north side of the Liffey. So that's where the Monto came from. They moved them over to Montgomery Street, and that's where the Monto came from. The lady came from. They moved them over to Montgomery Street, and that's where the Monto came from. The ladies of the night who were over here moved over to north side. So he cleaned up the area and became very gentrified. It became a very prosperous area. It was a great area to have a second home. It was your holiday. So a lot of people lived in, in Dublin Castle. Or worked, or worked in Dublin Castle, in and around Dublin Castle, and they had holiday homes here. Now you'd say you'd have a holiday home down in Ross Lair or down in Cork or Kerry, but at that time, having a holiday home in Sandymount was a big deal. The Martello Tower, uh, famous, was built in 1805. It was built to invasion from Napoleon. Of course, it didn't come to pass. But a lot of Martello Towers, you'll see one out in Sandyman, of course, one in Dalkey, and one in Hoth, and along, along a lot of the uh, east coast of Ireland, you'll find Martello Towers. Now, the green itself was again a problem for Mr. Murphy, because there was a lot of what you call for Mr. Murphy, because there was a lot of what you call hangers around, and he wasn't happy with that. Uh, so he approached uh, the Honourable Sidney Herbert, who owned this area. Uh, and he was known as the patriotic, patriotic landlord, and they had a meeting in Tunstall's Bar. Uh, I'll find out where that was shortly. But they had a meeting in Tunstall's, in Tunstall's Bar. Uh, I'll find out where that was shortly. But they had a meeting in Tunstall's Bar, and in 1833 he fenced in the green, which was a major achievement and a big thing for making. Again, it's like if you lived up around Fitzwilliam Square, uh, only those who lived around the green had a key, so it was a great place to live. You had a key for the green itself. It had a key. So it was a great place to live. You had a key for the green itself. In 1841, there was 1,100 people living in Sandymount. In 1870, 4,000. And what we know generally as Sandymount today, there are about 9,000 people. So if you remember from 1654, we had 80. We're now up to 90. It became very popular to be in Sandymount when, in 1849, Queen Victoria arrived in Ireland. Not the most popular person in the world. Neither she nor we were amused when she arrived. Uh, but she arrived in Dunleary and she was making her way towards the Vice Regal Lodge in the Phoenix Park. And she was travelling on this new fangled system called the Railway. Now the railway ran from Kingstown to what is now Pier Street Station. Uh, but they actually built a station at Sandymount Avenue, specially for her. Uh, so she could get off her train and travel by horse up to Dublin uh, Castle first and then on to... Uh, onto the Hive Sandy Mount, a non-bus service, a bus service arrived, first call, a regular service opened on July 2nd from the Lear Street, uh, from uh, the Phoenix Hotel in the Lear Street, uh, to Sandy Mount. The fare was truppence. Uh, if you remember, the fare was truppence for a, 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 a tram ride from uh, the centre of the city to Sandy Mount, in Ring's End, so not too sure which was the best. In 1916, Sandy Mount Castle, which we all know, was owned by Countess Markovich. Uh, and our family, the Plunkets. Uh, the, on Easter Thursday, the, day bef uh, the Thursday before the Easter Rising, a gentle time, they were um, uh, taking people who were being orphaned off boats in the port and taking them off. They were being sent to England, just abandoned, and they were being taken, and they were taken to the school here, and they were being taught and given trades. And the maths teacher on the Thursday walked out and never returned. This teacher on the Thursday walked out and never returned. He walked out in his uniform, and that was Eamon de Valera. His last maths class was taught in the Simon Castle. So just a little bit about pubs, since we're in a pub. In 1685, the first legislation to license pubs. In 1685, the first legislation to license pubs was brought in. Sounds like it's, it's really... Not that long ago. Uh, at the time, there was taverns. A uh, tavern was a place where you could uh, stay overnight. An inn was somewhere you could drink and eat. A public house was somewhere you could drink and eat. A public house was 
sort of what we have today. Um, a bar uh, was simply for uh, those who would be of lower classes. So there was a distinction what type of pub you could go into, whether it was a bar or a public house. Uh, Drells were simply open to have a bar in it rather than to house people. In 1838, uh, this gentleman, Father Theobald Matthew, founded what was known as the Top Total Abstinence Society, Temperance Movement, with almost a third of the nation signing up, and it changed the license trade forever, for decent. Uh, not so much the people went off to drink, they did, but it made the publicans kind of um, change their tack. So you couldn't just be a publican, you couldn't just serve drink. So it became spirit grocers. They became the grocery, they became the undertaker, they became the hardware shop. They sold, you know, the pub was divided the undertaker, they became the hardware shop. They sold, you know, the pub was divided into two to try and keep the business going. So that's where the spirit grocer came from, was through the total absence movement. It also meant that uh, we had what was known as cardio shops. You know, I don't know who would want to visit a cardio shop today, but if you had, see Black Horton or Orange, so they opened these cardio shops to try and circumvent this total abstinence. But they also served cheap wine or Benedictine, which was of a lower anything below what we describe today as fifteen percent alcohol was described as a cordial. So you people who are going in to have a black curtain who are coming out drunk and couldn't understand why. In eighteen fifty for the first time there were no new licenses issued in Dublin. That was a big thing. Uh, at that time if you were of reasonable financial security and you know which place to put the brown envelope, you got a license. So like in Wine Tavern Street, uh, in pubs, today, none. Also in 1850, again due to the, as I said, to the total absence society, publicans diversified. So again, there's a pub in Cavan, uh, in Open Valley, James Duff, where you man, you walk in, it's a, it's a hardware, but the pub is down the back, and if you go to your right, you'll find the, you'll find the, the coffins ready for you. In, uh, no new licenses were issued. In 1888, there were 21,000 pubs in Ireland. Yeah. Today, there are only 7,193. So we've lost two thirds of the pubs. So we've lost two thirds of the pubs. In 1927, the new Irish Free State Government closed the pubs on St. Patrick's Day and Good Friday. The St. Patrick's Day ban wasn't lifted until 1961. And the Good Friday wasn't lifted until 2018. And of course in 2004 the smoking ban was oh, You probably walk around the village. Now I was growing up here, I remember two pubs. I know there are three pubs now. So the two pubs I remember were Brian's Sandy Mount House and O'Reilly's. Now the way I look at it, these two fell in love and had a baby called Morgan's. <laughs> so that's the reason it's three pubs. But over the next little while you're going to hear about a few other pubs in the village. You're going to hear about Conniving House, which is out on the beach where beach is today where um, Marine Drive is. You hear about Annie Tunstall's. You hear about Annie Tunstall's. You hear a little bit about the board house in the Tatch. Now that was at the very top of Sandy Mund Avenue. It closed in 1850, or it was closed by the government, uh, basically because, as you remember, in 1849, Queen Victoria arrived, and the board house had a bit of a reputation for, again, not to put a poo fine appointment, point, they came on out, and instead of having bunting out, they hung their knickers on the railings, and the uh, local constabulary were happy and immediately closed the pub, and that was the reason the board house disappeared from Simon Avenue. Uh, and the Foxes is where Spa is today. Mitchell's Corner, we hear about that. Sandy Mount Hotel. And not alone did we have ordinary books, but we had sheep beans called the Cockle Hall, illegal drinking dens. And Mary Kent's. I'll also tell you about Darcy's. I'll also tell you about Darcy's. And Finlayers. So a lot, of, a lot of pubs to get through in a short space of time. We thought there was just three I had to go through. So why did Sandy Mount become popular? Uh, one thing was horse racing. Anybody went to the Laytown races on the beach? That's huge down there. It was huge up here. Something 
would pound the walls along standing on strand to watch steeplechasing on the strand itself. It was huge. Uh, the reason it kind of came to an end was, again, usual drink became a problem. Uh, too many drunken fight, quarrels and fights uh, in and around the village. Uh, and when the races were on, the police decided there was ones that the pubs were all closed. There was no re reason to have the racing and it stopped. Another reason that was popular on Sunny One Strand was dueling. So you would, uh, if you were having a fight with someone, you would go down and you would pistols at dawn and you would take your 10 steps back and you would turn around and fire. Uh, that was very popular from about 17... would turn around and fire. Uh, that was very popular from about 1790 until 1830 when it was outlawed. Again, Michael Murphy made an outlaw because the problem was it was fine that you were having a duel with your uh, opponent, uh, but it wasn't fine that you were leaving the body behind and the bodies were rotten on the beach playing, especially those residents in the San Juan Hotel. Transport, of course, became big. It got a train service into uh, San Juan Avenue in 1849 when Queen Victoria came, and then the omnibus service arrived. Uh, there was a plan to uh, open uh, the local San Juan Avenue and the beach right through San Juan Village, uh, but what it was called the San Juan Atmospheric Railway, uh, but it didn't come to pass. Uh, but what they did do, they invested in a the bridge at Ring's End. It was a wooden bridge, uh, so you get a tram as far as Ring's End. It was a wooden bridge, uh, so you get a tram as far as one side of the bridge because the bridge couldn't take the tram. You'd have to get off, walk across the bridge, and get onto another tram on the other side of the bridge. So what they done was they invested in rebuilding the bridge to an iron bridge. Again, Cranfield Baths. Again, the baths are very popular. Cranfield Baths and, and Morphy's Baths. Again, the baths are very popular. Cranfield Baths and, and Morphy's Baths. Sporting, of course, was huge around here. Uh, that's the uh, IFA win cup winning time team of Shelbourne, and they used to play uh, along Sandymon Road, um, where uh, houses were built. Houses were built uh, along Sandymon Road. There was a sports ground down. Again, we had a load of cricket grounds, uh, we had rugby grounds, very, very big sporting area. So there were the houses that were built where the grounds were, they were built for, um, in, after the First World War. For the Again, tourism was popular, the beach was popular, so people came down to the beach. And that's, for anybody who's never seen it, that is the old pier that went out to the baths in Samuel. Uh, unfortunately, it was washed away. So, talk about in Samuel. Uh, we, we, we're 100 years here today as O'Reilly's, and uh, I can go back to 200 years, but this is 300 years ago. It opened in 1723, a two-storey thatched cottage out on the seafront. It was opened by a man called Jack McLean, and we'll come across his name later on. For, it was opened by a man called Jack McLean, and we'll come across his name later on for some other reason. But Jack McLean opened it, and he was very popular. He had... He was seemingly very famous for his seafood, of course, right beside the beach, uh, and also famous for his music, uh, traditional Irish music. He had two great musicians, and that's what you, 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 you can put your hook into. There were two great musicians called Larry Grogan and Jack Latin. Uh, Larry Grogan was the first, he's known as the first exponent of the Ilan Pipes. He was a piper, and he came up with the Ilan Pipes. Uh, one of his most famous tunes is Ali Croker. Uh, it's still played by a lot of uh, traditional musicians around tonight. You might ask them if they'll be able to play it for you. Now, Jack Latin and Jack Latin was a fiddle, a fiddle player and dancer, so kind of river dancing one. Uh, Larry Grogan, in 1730, decided he he fell in love with a girl who who came in off a ship, and he decided he'd go off with her onto the girl who who came in off a ship, and he decided he'd go off with her onto the ship, and he went out to Barbados in 1730 and by 1731 he was dead. He was buried in Barbados uh, having died of typhoid and uh, probably caught on the ship going across. Jack Latin was uh, Jack Latin was a, a man who wasn't afraid to take on a bet. So one of the bets he took on was that in the pub he took on this bet. He lived in a place called uh, just outside Nice. And the bet was that he would be able to dance the whole way down. 
So every jig to whatever. And he said he could do it. They said he couldn't. It was a bet on. He did it. But unfortunately, throughout his tour, uh, trip down, he got rained on, he got drenched, and within five days he had died of pneumonia. He died in 1732. So, uh, done well, uh, bought the pub. He was the dresser to the Lord Lieutenant. He, he dressed all the high ploy up in Dublin Castle and in the Voice Regal Lodge. And he started, uh, his family were very famous as engineers. Uh, at the time, again, the, the Grand Canal and the Royal Canal were being built, and his family were the engineers who designed most of the bridges uh, that you see across the Grand Canal and the Royal Canal, including the Touche Bridge in Portobello. Uh, but he, he kind of diversified and he became a, a fashionista, as suppose that's how you put it. Uh, but he bought the pub, and the thing was he wasn't a publican. And the thing was he wasn't a publican. And he diversified his business, and he was probably the earliest version of maybe Victoria's Secret that we had. He decided to design silk undergarments for women, which the women didn't want. And he failed. So both his business in the fashion and his pub went bust. And, he, and the pub, despite numerous efforts in, in, in the paper to kind of get it sold, it wasn't sold, and it actually just fell and collapsed, and just through rash and ruin. Again, it was beside the sea, and it was so. So this is the next pub. So this is the Irish Arms. Irish Arms. Now the Irish Arms was opened in 1780, and the Irish Arms is where Sandymount House is today. It was opened by a man called Joseph Doyle. Uh, but a man called Patrick Redmond took it over uh, in 1798. But unfortunately, Patrick Redmond's brother became involved with Robert Emmett, and he was involved in the 1803 revolution. And despite his best attempts to flee the British by dressing as a woman, he was captured in Newry, brought back to Dublin, and hung. Results again, remember. Michael Murphy was trying to clean up the area. Uh, the pub was boycotted, basically boycotted as it would be described today. And uh, eventually the Redmonds had to leave and the pub was abandoned and it was torched and burned to the ground. It, at the time it was just a was all it was. But it, w it would be rebuilt. So I mentioned earlier uh, that they met at Tungstall's um, hotel. This is Annie Tungstall's hotel, still stands today. Uh, this is where she was. Annie Tungstall, her, her husband was Frank Tungstall. He ran the hotel was. Annie Tungstall, her, her husband was Frank Tungstall. He ran the hotel at the Pigeon House. Uh, when the Pigeon House Hotel was requisitioned by the British military in around the 18, uh, 1800, 1801, because of uh, the revolutions in Ireland and because of the threat of Napoleon, uh, they moved uh, the revolutions in Ireland and because of the threat of Napoleon, uh, they moved to here. And this became Annie Tunstall's hotel. Fine hotel. Uh, and she stayed there until uh, 1836 when she died. It was taken over by Sarah Goodison. It was taken over by Sarah Goodison. And Sarah Goodison uh, decided she could do better. So she decided she'd emigrate to America. Again, remember, this is about 1840, 46, 49, so it's sort of famine time. So they decided to go to America, so Sarah Goodison, you can see here from the record, she went down to Queen to America, but never made it. She died in Queenstown in County Cork before she got onto the boat. So I'm gonna look now at some of the places uh, that you might recognize. So. On the corner here, uh, where the bank is, uh, was then there. Uh, you'll recognize a man called James Chute, who we'll talk about as well. Uh, James Nedley, and uh, there's a woman named, who else is there? Uh, Hugh Riley, I'll talk about him as well. So they're all involved in Mr. Nedley's, I'm meeting in Mr. Nedley's. And uh, Nedley's was on the corner where the bank is. Again, it's, it's a little bit, was on the corner where the bank is. Again, it's, it's a little bit confusing, uh, so, because, because some of the pubs diversified and became, they're not as pubs we knew today. Uh, so you walk into a pub, so, and you know, there's only drinks there. 
So a lot of pubs would be grocery shops. Or, yeah, grocery shops. List of what your groceries were. And you give it into the guy behind the counter. And then he'd send you down to the back room, in the back, and you could have a few drinks while the, the stuff was being put together. Uh, so they became a kind of a pub grocery. But they wouldn't have a license to sell the drink on the premises, like an off, and like an unlicensed. It'll be an off license. So this is it. Uh, I don't know if anybody would recognise it as it was. Um, the corner, Mitchell's Corner, became known and famous. Uh, the Mitchell family. Uh, if you go to some of the pubs around the city, you'll see some of their lovely mirrors still there. The Mitchells. Uh, it later became Bats Pharmacy, and then Mitchells. Uh, it later became Bats Pharmacy, and then the uh, Blue Orchid, Blue Orchid uh, restaurant before it was knocked completely and became a bank. Uh, in 1900, Fontenoy uh, GA Club was founded in 98 uh, in Mitchell's Corner. Later became Tanagale Fontenoy. So these are some of the people who owned uh, 98. And you'll recognise a few names uh, from later. In, in the history of both the area and of Dublin publicans. You'll notice Daniel Moroni, that's the same Moroni's that have Moroni's in Pierce Street. Thomas Rumble wants Daniel on Green. And Slattery's is the same Slattery's as in Bath Avenue. So, uh, but in 1909, uh, Annie Moroni sold it to Kate Fleming. Now, remember the name Kate Fleming? It'll come up again and you'll see what is important. Which sadly but we still miss it. Number five, Simon Green, was a public house. It was originally Darcy's public house. Darcy's was at one time the second largest brewery after Guinness in Dublin. And of course, any brewery, like they have in England, any brewery would need a pub to sell their beer. So they bought a pub in Simon, which was, was Darcy's. It later became Nolan's uh, after that uh, in the um, late 1800s. And it became Edward Tipper's. Uh, before it was sold in 1910 to Patrick Fleming. Again, remember the name Fleming. It will come up again and again. Again, remember the name Fleming. It will come up again and again. Uh, and again, uh, you don't ever see, you never really go to a barman's funeral. It's always a publican. A barman always becomes a publican. And again, this is one of the barmen who worked in, in Darcy's pub. He went on, John McGrain actually became a very famous public in the city, uh, led the Licensed Fitness Association for many years uh, in the early 1900s. So this is the very first, again as I, as I told you, the, the house at number one, standing on Green on the corner, uh, was the Irish Arms, it got destroyed, but it was really a man called William uh, Armstrong Stewart. And he rebuilt it and it became a pub again. And this is the first drawing of the pub and it was owned by Hugh Riley. So right on the corner you'll see uh, where the pub was put. So it reopened as a pub in 1838. Under Hugh as a pub in 1838. Under Hugh Riley. Hugh Riley unfortunately died in 1850 and his uh, wife Amelia uh, didn't want to hold on to it. So it was sold and became the Sandymount Tavern. And it was again, it, it went through a succession of owners very quickly. Uh, a lot of people uh, were trying to make good. And you didn't own a pub at the time, you more or less took the lease. Uh, the, it was, the owner was still the landlord of the area, so it would have been still. Um, uh, the Fitzwilliams went, uh, went through afterwards, Sandman House. John Butler had it. And then Patrick Fleming. And again, Patrick Fleming took over. Now John Butler had a hard time in the, in, in the pub uh, in 1866 when he was ejecting a customer. Uh, the customer fell back, hit his head on the pavement outside the pub with manslaughter and it seemed to affect him very badly. He sold his pub on to Patrick Fleming, who was from County Limerick, married to a girl called Katie English from Tipperary. And Fleming was a cute man. Katie was the buyer of number 98. Sandy Mount Green, which is on the corner, Green, which is on the corner, and Patrick was the buyer at number five, and as soon as they bought the two of them, they closed the two of them and got rid of the licenses. Less pubs, more business for him.
So that's how we start to lose pubs in the village, because they were being bought up by others. He would sell it on then, uh, Patrick Fleming sold it on, he went off. He would sell it on then, uh, Patrick Fleming sold it on, he went off, uh, he bought a, a hotel out in Dunleary, and he sold it to Sylvester White, and we'll come across Sylvester White a lot more later. He sold it on to Joseph Ryan, who was here uh, from the mid 1920s, uh, right up in the 1950s, 1960s, had the air raid sermon for the village during World War II up on top of the roof of the building. How you doing? Uh, they were sold to Helens, then became Fagans, and today it's Ryan's of Samuel Green. Now I love this picture. So this is Patrick Cart, obviously going out to deliver his drink to the people. So you can see his bottles of porter. Again, he would have bottled his own porter, and he's taking it out to whoever's buying it off. So this is Fleming's of uh, Samuel Green. I love this picture for two reasons. I love this picture for two reasons. Firstly, about the horse and cart. Hugely important for a publican. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever been in the Stag's Head in Dublin. But if you ever were, the pub was rebuilt by a man called George Tyson in 1895. Uh, he was a haberdasher in um, Grafton Street and he married into the Mooney family. But when he rebuilt the pub, the Stag's Head in 1895, which was the first pub to have electricity and the first pub to have a telephone, uh, he would walk down from his haberdashery shop in Grafton Street down to the pub in, in his pub in Chatham Street. It's still there today. And a man called Tom Leary owned it at the time. And Tom used to have, like this, a horse and cart. And he used the horse to go down to the Guinness Brewery to get his barrels of porter to bring them back up. Ready right for the horse going downhill empty, but coming back up with 200 weight on its back, quite a bit of a chore. And he'd look at the horse and he'd say to Tom, I said, I love that horse. I, I, and give me the horse. Said, oh, no, 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 no. Then he started giving offers of money. And every day, every month, it would go up and nearly would say, oh, no, there's a bad front leg, there's a bad back leg, there's a wonky eye, there's a bad ear, you can't hear him on. He was putting them off, but eventually he got just to annoy him. So he sold him the horse in 1901. And Tyson knew exactly what he was doing. Because in 1903, the horse won the Punchestown Gold Cup. A horse called Save Conveyance. He knew exactly what he was buying. So he was cute. And again, the Fleming family haven't really gone out of the village. If you go, you'll find Flemings still on the... as you go in the entrance. So that's the Fleming family. Still have a, a vested interest in Sandymount. So here we have 86 Sandymount Road. As you can see, uh, I don't know how you pronounce that, Horny Mans. As you can see, uh, I don't know how you pronounce that. Horny man's. <laughs> you wouldn't get away with selling that today. Uh, horny man's tea. <laughs> okay. Uh, horny man's tea was being sold, sold at Bats at 80, 86 Sandymount Road. Now the Bats were a chemist, and as we know, Bats at 80, 86 Sandymount Road. Now the Bats were a chemist, and as we know, as we've seen earlier, Bats became the chemist in 98. But what happened to 96? Uh, 86? Of course, it became, uh, first of all, a garage, then it became a baker's, and then it became a pub called Jack McLean's. Then it became a baker's, and then it became a pub called Jack McLean's, named after the man who opened the conniving house. And today, of course, it's Mulligan's, the junior partner in San Diego's, ran by Kerry Harrison. You might recognize this from Google Maps, nice, nice building on the corner. It was a pub. It was the Sandymount Hotel. It was owned by Henry Howard in 1848. Now, Henry Howard was a really good uh, uh, businessman. So you can see down below, you can actually see Howard's Hotel, coins, 3D. So, so you would go in, drink, but he would give you the change back like that. So the only place you could spend it was back in his hotel. Absolute genius. Uh, that's where it is today, on the corner, number 7, Sandy Mung Road, right on the corner. Very popular with, uh, again, uh, Angle, uh, number 98, Mitchell Corner was Gaelic, uh, number 1, Sandy Mung Green was soccer, uh, this was cricket, so the Trafalgar Cricket Club. 
had their headquarters at uh, the Sandymount Hotel. Now, unfortunately, the Sandymount Hotel went through a huge amount of owners in the last too long. A lot of the problems stemmed from serving after hours and getting pressure from the police. So if you got pressure from the police, you couldn't really renew your license, so you had to get rid of it. Uh, you can see a lot, of, a lot of names have gone through it. Etchingham's was quite famous. Uh, in uh, Arthur Etchingham, who was from County Wexford, seemed to have do well, quite well there through a, a really lean patch. And eventually the Irish Town Guard Estate, well, DMP, Dublin Metropolitan Police, objected to the licence and it was eventually lost. Again, but the, the, the hotel done really well because of uh, the races. A lot of people stayed there and a lot of the stewards, stewards' inquiries would be held in there. There and a lot of the stewards, stewards' inquiries would be held in there. And you can see that on your right hand side there, Captain Bartley's great, great feat of walking 1,000 miles in 1,000 successive hours. What a, what, a, what a effort that was. So, the guy who was employed to do that was a, a guy called. So, the guy who was employed to do that was a, a guy called Richard Manx. He was known as the uh, Sheffield Antelope. Uh, he had done this feat in Sheffield uh, previously and he was employed by Mr. Doyle at the time who owned the hotel to come across and do the similar thing and they would sell tickets for Doyle at the time who owned the hotel to come across and do the similar thing and they would sell tickets and there was uh, special omnibuses coming out from the city centre and it was on all night so the pub and the bar was selling all night uh, and he advertised it heavily in the newspapers and sold a lot of tickets uh, but obviously, uh, again, pre, so when R Richard Manx came across, he was about 25 stone. So he wasn't going to be walking a, a thousand miles in a thousand successive hours. So they got some, a local person, a man called Mr. Levers, who was at the time uh, involved in the shop in the corner here where uh, the um, spar is now. Uh, he'd done a, a walk for them, but he only lasted nine hours. And a lot of people were looking for their money back. an unprecedented walk. But again, it was a sporting place, it was such a big grounds. Uh, they had races uh, in the grounds. Again, money was put on the side once the horse racing had stopped. And also, again, money was put on the side once the horse racing had stopped. Athletics sort of took over. But again, it was all to do with uh, money being put on the, on the side. Again, as I was trying to explain, there was a lot of pubs that are not pubs anymore, or weren't supposed to be pubs. This is one of them. Number two, Sandy Green. It was actually a pub as we know it today, but it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, and so uh, there was an objection to the license in 1883. Uh, as you can see there at the top, uh, Patrick Law or two standing on green, similar application, refused, uh, not required. So they didn't require another pub in, in the village. Uh, but it was sold on, uh, it became Finn Later's off license rather than an on license. Again, not happy with just having good pubs, we had Shebeens. Uh, so this is uh, from the 18, 1920s. Uh, this is Mary Kent at New Grove Avenue. Uh, so she was selling drink when she shouldn't have been. Not the only one. We had this one in 1838, which was known as Cockle Hall. And it was a serious effort by the authorities to try and tamp down on illegal Shebeens uh, across the city. And the Cockle Hall was uh, caught not once. Not twice, three months. So I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, I'm going to let you listen to one of the most famous pieces of music in any pub in Ireland, the till ringing. So I'll take a break for about 15 minutes. And when I come back, I'm going to tell you the story of this building, number 5 Seaford Avenue, which was in fact Sandyman. I wonder why that was. We'll be back in about 10 minutes. One, two, one, two. Uh, you're all pretty welcome back. Uh, we're going to do uh, a little short piece now, again, on the real history of this pub. So this is purely the story of number five, Seaford Avenue. So how far does Seaford Avenue go back? So it goes back... So it goes back to a pub that was here in 1815. 
called the Eagle Tavern. It was opened by a man called John Larkin, who opened the Eagle Tavern. He was quite uh, a man called John Larkin, who opened the Eagle Tavern. He was quite uh, quite a, a well-known entrepreneur in the area. He done very well for himself. And in fact, uh, Seafort Gardens here uh, to our left was known at one time as Eagle Terrace. Again, because uh, this was the Eagle Tavern. Kind of going through a revolution. Again, this was because of Michael Murphy. So a lot of the businesses became a little bit more upmarket. So we have this, Ripley and Burns, uh, who opened in uh, November 1828. That's where the shop is on the corner. You saw that later as well. I remember the white house, Brackens, Brackens. It, it later became Hanrahan's and Fox's and Leverts and Fry's and then it became Brackens. So the Eagle Tavern, uh, when um, John Larkin died, it was sold to the Chute family. You see James Chute, it was sold to the Chute family. You see James Chute here. Dublin grocer, but unfortunately in 1836 he went bankrupt. You know, you think that was the end of that, but in fact the Tute family lasted here until the 1890s. But James Tute here on the right hand side, you'll see James Tute, uh, grocer, Sandy Milk, which is at prohibited hours, so he's serving after hours. Naughty, naughty boy. Uh, the policeman said he saw a girl knock on the door and she wanted tea and was admitted and he observed three or four more persons enter. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a good thing to be doing. Below in 1839, James Tute was fined uh, in mitigated penalty for a similar offence, as was Hugh Riley in the far corner, and the offence was selling spirits less than the full amount. So he was short changing not a good man. So this is 1838. This is the first map of this building that was ever mapped. So this was uh, James's Chutes. So in 1841, again you can see it was here. There it is. It's number 34. So this was the 34th house built in Sandyman Village. And that's why it's number 34. A huge garden at the back where uh, it became Eagle Terrace. So how how nice a person was Mr. Chute? Well, this is him here, James Chute in 1843. He was charged and imprisoned for stabbing his sister with a dining fork. Nice man. Perhaps under the influence. So the Chutes were here in 1890. Uh, and you can see that it's, uh, even though it says James Chute, it's 5 Sandymount Avenue, it's actually 5 Seaford Avenue. Again, he was summoned for having the premises open for the sale of drinks. This was actually James Chute's son, James Jr. Uh, but in 1890, this was actually James Chute's son, James Jr. Uh, but in 1890, the pub was for sale. The licensed, licensed house and premises formerly known as the Eagle Tavern, now known as 5 Seaford Avenue, uh, was given to Michael Doyle on a lease, uh, but it was still owned by the Chute family. But it was sold in 1890. Lease. Uh, but it was still owned by the Chute family. But it was sold in 1890 to Sylvester White. And this is 1891 when he applied for his first license. The license was granted. And this glass, if you get a chance, uh, which is a really amazing piece of history to have. If you come up to the pub, where amazing piece of history to have. If you come up to the pub where I'm standing and you go to the right where the glass cases are, you'll actually see that glass is in the glass case here. It is still here today. Uh, Sylvester White's. Uh, so he came in here in 1890. And this is Sylvester White's uh, from his Wicklow. He was here with his brother Dennis uh, and his sister at one stage, uh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah went off and she married another publican in Balls Bridge. Uh, but then Sylvester was doing well here. So what did he do? He upmarked. So he went across the road and he bought from Fleming, bought number one Sandman Green, and left Dennis to run here. In 1924, uh, Sylvester died. And uh, it was sold. Uh, both uh, number one Sandman Green was sold, and number five Seaport was sold. So Thomas O'Reilly, who was the so Thomas O'Reilly, who was the original uh, O'Reilly here. This is him when he went to Bourne County Cabin and he moved to Belfast. 
Obviously, there's a few Catholic people getting out for the day. Uh, he married Agnes Clark from County Melast, and where he became a publican at Cooper Street 109. There's actually 107 Cooper Street, not 109, uh, according to that. And you can see there on the left-hand side where he got his license. Uh, he went, he bought, he got his license first in 1900. Uh, 1900 is when he got his license, Thomas O'Reilly 107, Cooper Street. Uh, a man called Owen McMahon. I'll explain how important that was uh, for the reason that the O'Reilly family left Belfast. You see that on the paper there for a system wanted in his business at Cooper Street. And Dad got the job. Uh, but again, a bold boy, Thomas O'Reilly 107. A bold boy, Thomas O'Reilly 107, Cooper Street publican was summoned by the head constable T. R. Reddy for knowingly selling a pint of porter to an un uh, in an unsealed vessel to a boy named James Close, who was under 14 years of age on February 29th. Naughty boy. February 29th. Naughty boy. Shameful, shameful. But unfortunately, things in Belfast took an ugly turn. Uh, we all think of the War of Independence down here and the Civil War, but in Belfast it was completely different. Even in that period, it was very sectarian. And these even at that period, it was very sectarian. And these are the number of dead uh, people who were killed in 1920, from 1920 to 22 in a small area in Belfast. Uh, and Cooper Street was at the heart of it. Now, at that stage, uh, he had left Cooper Street. This is Cooper Street, again, he was bombed out, right? Uh, this is when he was sold to Matthew Hanlon, uh, Tom, uh, formerly occupied by Thomas O'Reilly. So he had left Cooper Street and he moved to Dilly Street, but unfortunately the troubles continued. I remember mentioned Owen McMahon. He was another publican in the city, and uh, one night in 1922, uniformed policemen went into his house uh, under uh, Captain Nixon. Uh, they, just, they separated the men from the boys, so there was the father, Owen McMahon, and his uh, four sons, and the bar manager at the pub where they worked and the boys were all shot dead in the living room and the women were left upstairs. They were all shot dead in the living room and the women were left upstairs. It was a uh, massacre of the McMahon family. So things were fairly bad in Belfast at the time and hence uh, he moves out. Now where the Red Star is, is where Cooper Street was, uh, where 107 Cooper Street. On the left hand side you see a star, that was Cooper Street in Belfast. And where the star on the right hand side you can see it's right on the blue line. That's the peace wall in Belfast as it is today. So where the pub was uh, is now actually on the peace line in Belfast. So I suppose there's some good come out of the pub. So he moves south. And this is worked yesterday on the application of Mr. John McDonald's solicitor. A transfer of a seven-day license attached to number 5 C4W. If anyone was granted to Mr. T. O'Reilly, Inspector Park, on behalf of the police, offered no objection. Now we are. This is lovely. This is June, uh, June 1922, uh, June 2022. But this is actually 22, uh, June 2022. But this is actually May 2022. So a little bit behind schedule. Uh, so it was May 1922. He got the transfer license. Agnes unfortunately died in 1935, and Thomas himself died in 1950 down through the O'Reilly family and, and we're thankful they're still here today and we're away to see some of the O'Reilly family here in front of us today. Uh, on, he, didn't, he got off to a bit of a rocky start unfortunately. Uh, sequel to an armed raid. So he was uh, barely a couple of months in the pub in September uh, 1922. Uh, this pub was raided. Uh, there were two raids in the pub but basically is what happened. Uh, first of all he was raid, raided by armed men who said they were Policeman, but weren't policemen. And then he was raided by policemen who said they were policemen and he didn't believe it. Uh, so uh, it seemed to be a little bit of confusion. Uh, so uh, it seemed to be a little bit of confusion. And again, the fact that he had come from the north was a bit of. Uh, he was overly welcomed in the area. Uh, and again, a statement had to be put into the newspapers a correction uh, by, the, by a solicitor was Michael Bergen. My attention has been drawn to the report of a licensed Michael Bergen. My attention has been drawn to the report of a licensing prosecution in connection with the premises of 5C4 Avenue, Sandymount, 
appearing in your issue of yesterday. It is only fair that I should correct the statement of my counsel, Mr. Joseph O'Connor, who is reported to have stated that one of the CID men who was carrying out investigations reported to have stated that one of the CID men who was carrying out investigations in the premises was disarmed. It was a national soldier who was disarmed and not one of the members of Oriel House. Oriel House is where the, what we've described today as the special branch was located. I would like to thank you uh, to insert this in your newspaper or in your uh, next issue, 22. Now, his son Malachi arrived down. Malachi obviously had a little bit of a sense of humour. So in the Sunday Independent on September 10th, 1922, he had a joke. An old gentleman went in, to, went out to tea and being somewhat deaf was unable to join in the generation. A kind-hearted lady wishing to make him feel at home said, Do you like bananas? To which he replied, No, I sleep in the old-fashioned nightshirt. <laughs> and Malachi went on to become a doctor. Where did he go wrong? So again, O'Reilly's were, again, if you remember, in the times of past, O'Reilly's were, again, if you remember, in the times of past, uh, pubs uh, would bottle their own beers and their own spirits. They would come in casks and they would have the bottle themselves. And these are, were generously given to me, uh, these are the labels from uh, the Guinness bottles. As you can see, Thomas O'Reilly, 5C4 Avenue, labeled on the right hand side, Jemison. So obviously somebody was on the whiskey early, it says 2 Seaforth Avenue, which it is what it is. Again, Thomas O'Reilly, oh boy, he got overcharged, he got fined for overcharging, he was fined £20 for selling one pound of mixed fruit jam and one shilling in the middle of the war. Disgraceful behaviour. Uh, so, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope and I wish you all the best and the pub all the best for the next 100 years. I will be here in 101 years time to tell you the rest of the story. Uh, congratulations to TB, Dave. Uh, congratulations to TB, Dave and all the staff here. And I hope you have a really good night. There's going to be a bit of live music here afterwards. And I hope you enjoy the rest of If you have any questions, anybody have a question? Oh, what a great class. What a great class. Uh, if, if, if anybody's, I, I, if, I, if I run out of them, I can get you one too. Dave here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, enjoy the rest of your life. Thank you very much, folks.